2008. Okay. American Psycho. Bad guys may no longer wear black, but they do live in white walled modern homes. <laughs> okay. A Clockwork Orange. Who's seen that film? Okay. One of the more gruesome films here. So I'm going to stop, pause, and talk a little bit about this one briefly. Um, Stanley Kubrick's uh, highly stylized dystopian vision of the future in his 1972 film adaptation of Anthony Burgess's novella, A Clockwork Orange, demonstrates Rosa's theory, perhaps among the best. It deploys modern domestic architecture in a manner that is at once both captivating, captivating and horrifying. The film's modern environs function as a playground for the delinquent and sociopathic exploits of the film's main character, Alex and his band of hooligans as they roam the streets of London, pillaging, assaulting, and generalizing, generally terrorizing community and its fear-stricken populace. Uh, the deranged Alex and his beleaguered parents reside in a bleak, brutalist-style public housing development, which you see here, designated with an overly bureaucratic address called Municipal Flat Block 18A, Linear North. That's their address. Um, and it was played by the real-life Thamesmead South Housing Estate, located in southeast London. Its vast, empty concrete plaza, strewn with rubbish for added effect, and derelict entrance lobby sets an appropriately foreboding atmosphere. The juxtaposition of, the, of, of cheery, pristine modernism against chilling violence is used by Kubrick in one of the film's most disturbing scenes as Alex and his gang proceed to brutally assault writer Frank Alexander and his wife in the living room of their modern country home. Okay, so it's a good thing that this presentation is not the last one of the day. You don't want to see this one right before your head hits the pillow. It's a very gruesome scene that takes place in this modern country home. A very brutal murder, very over the top, a lot of blood and guts. Uh, but this is where it occurs. And somewhat traumatic uh, scene, somewhat traumatic to watch, I will say. Okay, again, those of you who've seen the film, you know what I'm talking about. And I should say, when the students have presented this work in class, we've had actually YouTube links to the scenes themselves. So we had more time, they would present this, they'd have a whole hour for it, and they would present the actual scene. So when you see the little film clips, it doesn't quite do the same when you just see the little uh, images here, the still shots. But when you see them uh, enacted and moving images, I think the power of modern architecture comes across even more strongly and as it's portrayed in a negative way. Uh, another film, Wall Street, uh, which portrayed the protagonist who was uh, in love with the phrase, greed is good, took place in this setting. That was his home in Long Island. Uh, Fracture, 2007, another film that housed a, a villain in that modern home, as you see here. North by Northwest, uh, again, a Hitchcock film. Uh, Hitchcock actually made use of architecture very very closely in his films. He, was, he studied it very carefully, and uh, one of the books we used for the class uh, was all about Hitchcock's architecture and how it uh, was portrayed, uh, how it related to the characters, was right on target with my interest in environment and behavior. Modern Homes as Expression of Futurism, another theme uh, that came out in the literature and in the films that we saw. And so here are some, again, looking at what the future world would be like. Gattaca, this was one. The Minority Report, another. Uh, some other scenes from that film. Artificial Intelligence, anybody seen that one? Okay. Modern Homes is an expression of wealth. The penthouse, typically reserved for the wealthy, older, well-educated, and unsentimental type. Uh, by contrast, this film, It's a Wonderful Life, a husband returns from the office to a happy traditional home life with his wife and children and sometimes domestic help. Matrimony, a traditional institution, if there ever was one, was appropriately set in a traditional dwelling. By contrast, <laughs> conversely, modern domestic settings, invariably urban apartments, were reserved for youthful singles, the unusually wealthy, easy women, and terminal bachelors. So they lived in different kind of places, not the traditional American home. And again, back to Wall Street, uh, the apartment dweller was generally young and naive, <coughs> ambitious in a precious financial situation, uh, and uh, on his or her own, 
uh, on his or her own for the very first time. The penthouse typically reserved for wealthy, older, well-educated, unsentimental, as in this film. Um, also in the Hitchcock film, um, Rope. I don't know if any of you have seen the film Rope, one of his better films, actually. It all takes place in one penthouse apartment in New York City. Uh, two good friends are hiding a dead body uh, underneath a coffee table, actually. It's a very interesting and chilling kind of a film. Uh, but uh, it takes place in a rather stark-looking penthouse apartment in New York City. Uh, again, Family Man, 2000, Modern Homes is an Expression of Wealth. Uh, Modern Homes is an Expression of Instability, Dwellings that Serve as Signs for the Unstable, the Transitory, and the Amoral. Sleeping with the Enemy, 1991. Everybody seen that one? Okay. Ferris Bueller's Day Off, who's seen that one? Okay. I'll pause on this one briefly, too. Uh, John Hughes' 1986 teen comedy, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, underscores the negative bias towards modern death domestic architecture. The film's title character, played by Matthew Broderick, comes from a loving home with doting parents, as shown above. The Bueller residence conforms to traditional suburban aesthetics which, with its historically influenced architecture and well-manicured lawn. But Bueller's neurotic best friend, Cameron Fry, comes from what appears to be a much more dysfunctional family. Uh, and the Fry residence, in stark contrast with the cheery colonial style home up above, is a steel and glass Mesian box, pictured below, can delivered over a wooden ravine. And one of the quotes from the film by Ferris Bueller himself about that, that glass box home, he said, if I had to live in that house, I'd pray for disease too. The place is like a museum. It's very beautiful and very cold, and you're not allowed to touch anything. Can you appreciate what it must have been like to be there as a baby? <laughs> okay, and some other scenes from this particular film. But the implicit statement here is that uh, Cameron's malaise, his, his friend's malaise, is a, is a product, byproduct of the environment that he inhabits. And that's very consistent, I think, with Rose's thesis. So again, a few more images from that particular film and some of the bizarre things that go on in that house. The ice storm, anybody seen the ice storm? Okay. Um, a lot of pathology occurs in this particular house. The camera stalks through surrounding property, giving the impression it is spying on its inhabitants. Inevitably, the modern home house becomes the site of sexual indiscretions on the part of the adults and the children. <coughs> Stranger Than Fiction, anybody seen that one? 2006. Okay. Expression of instability again. And we're going to go into more detail on this in the paper, but just to give you a little overview. Chloe, anyone seen this one? Okay. Modern homes is an expression of idealism or consumerism, kind of the obvious here, as you would imagine. Uh, and let's see. Uh, modern homes and advertisements. Uh, I want to digress just briefly as we close to talk about uh, the contrast in how modern homes are portrayed in advertisements compared to how they've been portrayed in the movies. Uh, when we start looking beyond Hollywood films and broadening the scope to look at TV, in particular in ads, we see a slightly different portrayal of modern domestic architecture. While many of the themes that Rosa describes can also be found on American television shows, a more diverse representation of modern dwellings can be seen. In fact, the collective aversion to modern domestic design portrayed with such frequently on the silver screen in the movies has given way to an emerging, what we call a culture of cool on the TV screen. So that was the subtitle of the talk, The Culture of Paranoia to a Culture of Cool. Paranoid about modern architecture and modern homes in the movies for so, so, so long, but in ads actually become kind of cool and chic to show modern homes and contemporary homes. Um, and again, I guess the idea is, as we argue with the students, uh, trying to sell something. And so the view is a little bit different than what you see in the movies. So modernism and contemporary homes can become a good backdrop for whatever is trying to be sold. And one of the things that's sold most often in the U.S. ads are cars. And so lately we've seen a lot of cars that have been placed in front of modern homes um, as big selling points. Uh, frequently cast them as backgrounds.
backdrops in the, for the latest and greatest models. Uh, automakers Cadillac, Chrysler, Hyundai, Lexus, and Nissan have all rendered television ads recently featuring their, featuring their sleek, shiny new models carefully situated against modern dwellings. Uh, and you see some of them here. So again, the modern home becomes a selling point uh, for uh, the vehicle. And uh, we've also seen on TV, just in the last few years, a greater acceptance of modern homes and TV shows. And typically, again, though, what we're seeing is that uh, the modern home has become the setting for the non-traditional or progressive family structure and values, not the typical conservative American family. Um, but, uh, for instance, some shows have shown them with working mothers and stay-at-home fathers, um, or with uh, a mixed or blended family. Uh, as is the case in some of the shows portrayed here. This is one of them called Modern Family. This is another one called Parenthood. But again, you're seeing the modern home portrayed in a much more favorable light. Uh, so in conclusion, we would say uh, film directors, TV producers, advertising agencies have played major roles in influencing how the public, both in the U.S. and around the world, perceives the modern home for better or for worse. And while it's been met with varying degrees of resistance throughout its history, uh, perhaps some things just take more time to catch on than others, and I think the modern home is one of them. So, thank you very much.
Finally, through this example, I will try to, to show how film can be a re relevant medium to representation of inhabited space and of remembered space. And in doing this, I will oppose to Tarkovsky's attitude, the attitude of another great autobiographical filmmaker, uh, putting them in two opposing poles, one of them focused on spatiality, the other on corporeality. Uh, and through this, through this opposition, the familiar space traces a larger movement from body to space, a movement reflecting the fundamentals of architectural phenomenology. Um, Tarkovsky was born and active as a filmmaker in Russia, then emigrated to Italy, Sweden, and eventually died in France without ever returning to his motherland. For those not familiar with his work, I will briefly say that over a time span of 25 years, he had seven major feature films, all received well with an international acclaim and being accorded numerous prizes outside of Russia. While in Russia, he would be increasingly oppressed by the authorities of the state film studios. Um, his diaries ref reflect these professional difficulties by rendering them a dwelling quality. My soul is re restricted inside me and is another living space. Of his seven movies, the most relevant for the topic of inhabited space and absence of place and of spatial recollections are his film The Mirror, uh, precisely autobiographical, and two films made after he had left Russia. Due to their different geographic and emotional conditions, they have different levels of place, different levels of absence, different spatial nostalgias, but are similarly le relevant in unveiling the essence of home for Tarkovsky. During the time he was active, his most constant place of dwelling was a Moscow flat with leaking ceilings, of which ceilings of which he would constantly complain in his diaries and hardly ever identified as a home. Instead, the family was for years in a queue for a long-awaited proper house that was to be financed by the North Film, the state film studios. In the right side, you can see one of the polaroids that Tarkovsky liked to take of his dwelling places, an incredibly useful testimony of his mode of dwelling and of his way of viewing familiar space. Never receiving the promised new flat, the Tarkovsky settled for buying and refurbishing, refurbishing an old traditional cottage in the countryside in the village of Miasnoi, the only place identifiable as a home for the other days of the artist. All throughout his diaries, this statement is constantly repeated and underlined with vehemence. How lovely it is here in Miasnoi, I have a wonderful room. Afterwards, the years spent in Italy, Sweden and France are marked by Tarkovsky's constant search for a place to turn into a home. In his last years, he purchased and arranged a house in San Gregorio, Italy, but hardly ever got to inhabit it. He mostly lived in friends' houses and hotel rooms for short periods of time. With such a transitory way of living, it would be expected that his films would also be formed by a multitude of architectural influences. However, the spaces of his exile film con contain similar attributes to the first ones, and are imbued with the same atmosphere of home. On the top row, from left to right, are sketches from his diaries while in Russia and still working on the holiday house, then a photo of his wife inside this house, then a film still from Nostalgia, a film he made after he, he was in Italy, in a fragment where the protagonist of the film dreams of his home. On the bottom row, there is again a sketch of the countryside, in front of which Tarkovsky drew himself playing with his dog, and then again film stills from Nostalgia. Looking at these home images in his films, it seems that Tarkovsky was not in the process of inhabiting new alien spaces, but was taking with him to every new place an interior house, which gained increasing clarity, becoming ever more evident in its absence, and more and more acutely detailed in its film portrayal while its physical reality was dimming. The atmosphere of this interior home is the same as the one first unveiled and acutely present in his first autobiographical film, The Mirror, and it is essentially the atmosphere of his childhood dwelling. Tarkovsky's films are testifying for what many psychologists argue, that the first experiences of speciality imprint themselves most profoundly upon the imaginary, leading to the idea of this inner home as a quintessential pure image of the primarily lived childhood home. And films, whether biographical or non-biographical, would be means of representing such memories. In this context, and all throughout Tarkovsky's work, what rests stable along the clashes of interflows between exterior and interior, physical and psychological, 
real and imaginary past and present is actually the ineffable, ineffable essence of dwelling and experience as a child. The filmmaker's biography reveals that he identifies the childhood nest not with the Moscow apartment in which his family lived during his infancy, but with the dacha, the country house in the small village of Zabraje, where he was born and where his family would spend the first summers of his life. While still a child, this house perished under the, under the waters of the river Volga, when a dam was built in its proximity, thus triggering an entire poetics of loss and longing. The image of this first dwelling met in his films with that of another house where the family had taken refuge during the war in a larger village near Zabraje called Yuryevets. This house, belonging to some relatives, survived but remained distant because of changes in ownership, a reason for which Tarkovsky avoided to revisit it for over 30 years, sensing that the mental image of the house had remained more inhabitable than, than its transformed material image. When setting out to work for his autobiographical piece, The Mirror, the two situations of these childhood houses trigger two very interesting different spatial attitudes, the various layers of absence. In the case of the extinct, extinct Zavraje house, he visited a location where the, once one, where the house once stood and reconstructed it according to photographs and memories. Afterwards, seeking to better grasp, grasp the essence of a place he had maybe forgotten, the entire film crew spent days and nights on location in order to immerse themselves in the surrounding atmosphere. Here you can see an image of Tarkovsky and his mother on location, then of the actor who played young Tarkovsky in the film. Below are images from the actual film, The Mirror. As opposed to this complex attitude, the artist's approach to the, the other house, which was still existent in Eurovets, was completely different. After having finished the screenplay for the film, he visited the place after more than 30 years of not being there. Diary entries before this visit reflect his inner distress. Maybe I should not go at all, as not to lose yet another illusion. Too late now, I have to go. Upon return, he would say with this contact, I was discontent. I was correct to write in the script for the film I am now making that we should not return to the ruins. So I have lost one more illusion, perhaps the most important one for the preservation of the peace and quiet within my soul. I have buried my childhood home with my film. However, this diary entry was, was written before the actual filming of The Mirror. After having finalized it, Tarkovsky would say that he is no longer pressured by his painful memories of childhood, as if he would have somehow inhabit, inhabited them through the medium of the film. This is also how film critics have characterized the other of his works, as a place to inhabit. There are two main pos positions in Historically, there are two main positions in defining the image of the film. One of intellectual montage, which alter alters and manipulates the everyday perception. The other one of representing just what is real in front of you and unveiling the unseen perception of a place. Tarkovsky, Tarkovsky adopts both of them in his work and in working on remembered images of inhabited space. In my recent paper, I do go more into the theory of this, um, the film theory behind um, representing spaces in film, but I will mostly focus on the visual part in this presentation. Um, the essential idea that I have kept is that um, film theorists um, underline the film's capability of, uh, of showing familiar, familiar surroundings in a totally different light just by the way that the film uh, renders them, a, a, a different way of viewing them and of looking at them. Um, in terms of representing spatial memories, the theories of memories have, in, in terms of space have been uh, categorized in two main strands so far. One, which is essentially focusing on space deconstructed as perceptual. Memories are, are, are stored and awakened by re-embodying them while performing similar sensorial actions. The other strand opposes this and says that the self actually projects itself onto the surrounding space while perceiving it, and then space would somehow become a storage of memories. 
Thus, memories would be awakened by reemplacing yourself within the space. While in the first theory, the gaze is directed, directed towards the subject experiencing the place, in the second one, the gaze describes the space itself. Um, the, the opposition of these two theories is, is mostly relevant in talking about how Tarkovsky chooses to show his films. By bringing, as an example of the first re-embodied theory, the attitude that Ingmar Bergman, the Swedish director, has in his films. Also profoundly autobiographical, Ingmar Bergman would write a lot in, in his uh, diaries and autobiographical novels of the way he remembers his childhood home, but most of his, this, these memories are centered around his perception of it. He would say, my senses opened up and decided to keep all this. As the main character who impersonates, impersonates the young Berman in the film, in his essentially autobiographical film, Fanny and Alexander, as this character moves through his childhood house, changes in space are reflected on his face, shot in close-ups, while transitions between rooms never leave spatial em emptiness. In the very second the boy approaches one door, the view changes, a method used with constancy all throughout the film. As opposed to this, the houses in which Tarkovsky, Tarkovsky's film, the houses in Tarkovsky's film seem to have a life of their own and a movement of their own. Transitions between rooms and movements outside windows unfold independently, deepening the comprehension of speciality and inherently the sensation of inhabitation. I hope this is not too loud, it's a sound bit. Long shots caress the walls, textures and whether the doors close or are open by themselves under the gaze of the viewer, and characters leave the room and go off screen without any narrative, narrative explanations. The same distinction in depicting the inhabited space is also visible in the very process of shooting. While Bergman was always careful to indicate to his actors what the sensations they must experience in that place are, to enact and reenact his actual memories of that house, the impressions of senses and insights, he would be intrigued to find out that, unlike him, Tarkovsky would never leave such directions, although the entire narrative was also based on his most personal previous experiences and impressions. While working on the screenplays and closely directing the set, one of Tarkovsky's greatest concern was to achieve a sense of place and to build up a mood before the actual shooting took place. The spatial qualities were in such a manner that the actor's sensation would freely fly upon the physical enclosures, thus being reinplaced and transmitting naturally the impressions once experienced by the author. The precise detailed reconstruction of a place as once encountered is a mechanical artificial method which leaves out the actual direct experience, would say Tarkovsky. Instead, the lesson he would give, and was proved successful by the audience, is that direct and subjective experiences of a space can be distilled phenomenologically and reduced to the very essence of dwelling, and then translated into film as a medium equipped to turn it into an intersubjective experience. A place to inhabit. In other words, precisely what architecture above construction should mean. Thank you.
by recognizing the occurrence of marginality, hybridity, and liminality in both Brook and Mundau's protagonists, and analysis extending these qualifications to South African national identity, this study contains the descriptions of houses occupied by the two protagonists might also offer new insights in relation to the architectural expressions that houses that some new South African nation. The spaces, which can be related to what we know our terms, third space, embodied by the houses in the two narratives, crosses the boundary between the self and the other, and the magical and the real. In short, as the images explain, I'm taking a character from, well, the main character from Andre P. Brim's book, and then um, argue that she's extended into a certain architectural expression, and doing the same with Muda and the two architectural spaces, or spaces more than anything else, that's the expression, and saying that if these quantities are equal to that, those of South Africans, then maybe we should learn something from the architectural expressions, <laughs> from the fictional um, uh, narrations. Good. The first premise is really the phenomenological house, or the understanding of, of house. And Carson Harry brings, brings a conclusion here. If architecture can be understood as the construction of boundaries and space, boundary being the key word, this space must be understood as the common sense space, the space that possesses meaning and speaks to us long before the architect goes to work. So basically, we identify and orientate with the space because it's an extension of ourselves. We have the space or the architectural thing becomes then an occurrence that the boundary where the self is given to man's spatial understanding. The second premise, the fragmentation of space, the transitional period leading up to the first democratic election in South Africa fragmented the common sense understanding of space through a plentitude of marginalized claims to the space. Transition introduced the self, the apartheid entities, the modern nation. In the other, the marginalized, everything else of the Africana and all other nationalities in, in South Africa that was marginalized, forming a hybridized nation. A nation is becoming, or what Baumi Baba argues, Becoming, meaning that the identification and orientation is still in the process of becoming, or we identify and orientate with becoming and not with be as such, is articulated through the literary spaces. The question then is, if man is both the dweller and the other, if he's inside but also outside, and is not identified or orientated with a structured world, with the with world that's organized, within the boundaries of space, but rather with the thresholds, what will the architectural thing of this in-between space be, and how should it be reviewed? Orientating the genuine novels, imagination of sand deals with the return of the main protagonist from England to South Africa in the aftermath of an incident of arson that left the grandmother critically injured and her house partially ruined. The protagonist in ways of dying is a homeless man, and self to keep a degree professional mourner that is reunited with his home world from a tribal village through a funeral of his son. He eventually moves into a shack they built together. So once again, the same illustration, the main character being Christine, the building, a ruined bird palace, palace I'll expand on that just now, a ways of dying, the main character to Loki, and two um, spatial expressions, a uh, homeless snake, and also a shack. And then, of course, the comparison with the South African nation, and then the institute as the house of the nation. Christine and to Loki, 